Hello and welcome to episode two of the Jen Curtis podcast. In today's episode, I am going to talk about body positivity. And honestly, I wasn't going to talk about this topic just yet because I feel like my opinions are very, very controversial. Not because I have any particularly extreme opinions, but just because body positivity has become one of those kind of monoliths in our culture that you just have to agree with everything that they say. You, you're not allowed to question it at all. You're not allowed to agree with parts and disagree with others. And when you do say anything that goes against any of the claims of body positivity, you're attacked by what I consider to be very, very extreme um, zealots of the movement. And conversation is shut down. You're not even allowed to politely discuss it. And when I have brought this up in the past, when I've posted about it, I've gotten lots and lots of responses sort of saying, thank you, this is exactly how I felt about it, but haven't been able to put it into words. And basically, I think that body positivity is a very, very, it's one extreme of the kind of spectrum. Um, and on the other extreme is that kind of really icky, toxic diet culture, like 1990s fad diets, you know, the size zero fashions and all of those kind of things. Um, that we all recognise exists, right? We all know that there's this really, there is this really icky, toxic diet culture. Um, and we know that to be intuitively true. So when something comes along and is presented in opposition to that, it's like, oh, well, that must be, that must be true. That must be, you know, the objective reality. But I think it's just a really, really extreme backlash to that other side of things that we also don't want to go to. And I truly believe that there is a lot of really healthy nuance and healthy middle ground somewhere in between, you know, body positive, fat acceptance, um, love yourself no matter what, um, kind of really gushy self-love and the other extreme of kind of, you know, beat yourself into submission and you're a piece of shit if you gain even one pound. It's also a really tricky topic to talk about because the cultural zeitgeist is so, so strong around this topic that to even start to discuss any of the nuance in between, you have to sort of go on this really long journey and, 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 and take people through this journey to from A to B, um, which is qu quite rocky terrain and quite difficult to do. But I'm going to give it my best crack. This is probably like my fifth attempt at this now. So I'm going to give it a good crack and um, do my best to be really balanced and discuss the nuance, but also be very straightforward and direct in how I feel about this topic. So to kind of give an overview of my opinion, my opinion is that, um, like I said, it's an extreme backlash to another extreme stance on how we control our bodies and food. And neither one of these two extremes are good and that there's a lot of happy medium in between. And that the body positivity movement is really just wrought with all kinds of contradictions and just wrong, incorrect claims. It also sets up so many false dichotomies and straw man arguments um, that I'm going to try to address in this podcast. Now, whenever you do anything, I feel like this is one of those topics that whenever you want to talk about it, you have to set up all these caveats of like, just because I don't agree with body positivity does not mean that I agree with fat shaming. Um, I absolutely believe some of the claims, you know, that just because you're overweight doesn't mean you're unworthy, right? You can be a wonderful person. You can be a hardworking person. You can have, every, you can be very successful. You can have great relationships. You can be a very healthy, happy person, but not have your weight sorted out. And that doesn't mean that you're not worthy. Um, I feel like body positivity always kind of makes that claim that if you question it at all, they say, oh, so you think we should just fat, fat shame people? You think we should just, you know, like get rid of all fat people or whatever? And it's like, no, no, no. Just because you don't agree with one extreme doesn't mean that you agree with the other extreme. And I feel like it's these sorts of false dichotomies um, that 
body positivity sets up that really really irk me and um just just isn't true it's just they just don't give a fair representation of what an alternative might be again i'm going to try to map out what a, a, an alternative to body positivity could be so with those kind of caveats out of the way let's dive into part one some of the central claims of body positivity that i think are just downright wrong so first of all there's the claim that you can be healthy at every size and i think that most of us logically know that this simply isn't true you know if you have a 600 pound person like you see on those documentaries in the us who can't move can't get up and walk because of their weight and because of the amount of food that they eat they have to be like cut out of their house i think we all know that it's fairly obvious that you cannot be healthy at that size and on the other side of things you know there is a cutoff point below which a body fat percentage below which you can't be healthy either where hormone function completely disintegrates you know we, we all recognize that sort of like skeletal anorexic person and we know that that is not healthy either and for years we've been talking about amenorrhea and things like that in high performing athletes like gymnasts and ballet dancers um and we recognize that that is not healthy either so you know straight away we can straight off the bat we can say it is not possible to be healthy at every size there are some sizes at which it is impossible to be healthy but the more kind of central claim that they're trying to make is that just by looking at a person you can't tell if they are healthy and this has i think the reason why this is so hard to refute is that it does actually have just like a lot of claims of body positivity it does actually have a grain of truth to it that we all recognize you know if you are say 20 percent body fat right so you're a healthy or, or on the lean side um but you don't do exercise you smoke you don't manage stress um, you have mental health issues, your relationships are in tatters, you're, you have a terrible diet made up of junk food. Like this, we know that that is not healthy and that just from the outside, you can't necessarily tell if that person is healthy and, and just their size, just their body fat percentage doesn't tell you the whole story. This is absolutely true. And the, and the inverse is true. So if you have somebody who is you know, 35% body fat, a woman who's 35% body fat on the, on the larger size, um, but she eats well, she manages stress, she sleeps enough, she exercises, she has meaningful relationships and purpose in life. We, we know like th that person can be healthy despite her weight being on the higher side. But I think more recently the claims have been more extreme than that where they take really quite obese individuals um who and, and say you know you can't tell by looking at me that i am healthy that i am unhealthy or or whether i'm healthy or not um and again there is some grain of truth to that you might be really quite obese morbidly obese very very high body fat percentage and currently you don't have any health issues and you look after other areas of your health but it kind of reduces this down to a really black and white way of thinking about health because the opposite argument isn't that okay if you're obese you're automatically unhealthy the opposite argument is that being overweight having excess adipose tissue having too much body fat is an independent risk factor for all manner of chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes like high blood pressure like um heart disease like a stroke it, it literally is a um is is a independent risk factor for every single chronic disease going so the kind of middle ground argument isn't that okay if you're obese if you're in that obese category and these categories i do think are actually helpful but that's another topic the middle ground argument isn't okay if you're in that obese category you're automatically unhealthy the middle ground argument is that this is one particular in this particular independent risk factor is not in your favor so if you take somebody who is obese 
um, who drinks, smokes, doesn't sleep enough, doesn't manage stress, uh, doesn't exercise, doesn't eat healthily, and you get them to change one of those things. So if you get them just to eat healthy food instead of junk food, but they don't lose any weight and they don't change any other factors, they can improve their health. If you get them to exercise, they can improve their health even more, even if they don't lose weight. If you get them to manage stress, they can improve their health, health even more, but, but even if the other things don't change. And then if you get them to lose weight, they will also get healthier. And it's also true that if you take that same obese person with all of these risk factors, smokes, drinks, doesn't eat healthy, blah, 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 and they just lose weight, if they don't change anything else, right? If their diet is still shit, if they don't exercise, but they lose weight, they will get healthier. So even if all the other factors stay exactly the same, and that's the kind of nuance that is often missed. And the inverse is true. If you take somebody who is of a healthy weight and they start smoking, that is an independent risk factor. Even though all the other things they do in their life, that we still don't, we don't debate that that still makes them more at risk of certain long-term health conditions. If you take that healthy person of a healthy body weight and they put on 20 kilos, but they keep everything else the same, they still eat healthy food, they still exercise, they still don't smoke, all of that stuff, they become less healthy. So all of these separate factors like that I listed out, like smoking, drinking, sleeping enough, exercising, eating a healthy diet, being overweight, your body fat percentage, they all affect health independently of each other. And so if you improve one of them, you improve your overall health. And that includes getting slimmer, getting fitter, um, and losing body fat specifically. So the term health, healthy at every size is one of those terms that sounds really, really fluffy and lovely and inclusive and so we sort of have this instinctive tendency to want to to sort of say yeah well of course you know of course this is the right thing um, and I, I once heard someone say that if they were going to create a social movement they would call it water is wet because it's like it's like well, it's something that you can't you, you you can't refute and healthy every size has that kind of lovely sound that we all sort of instinctively want to support it but it isn't exactly true. And it kind of just misses some of the nuance about the fact that having more body fat makes you less healthy, independent of all of the other things. Absolutely, is it true that you can be in an overweight category and still be healthy? Yes, it's true. But the fact that you are or overweight makes you less healthy than you otherwise would be. And that's the kind of nuance that's missed out when we say haze and healthy at every size. The second claim that body positivity makes, so the first one is healthy at every size. The second claim that they often make, these are the ones that stand out to me, by the way, like there might be others, but these are the ones that most stand out to me and I have most issue with. So the second claim that I have a problem with is that our beauty standards are arbitrary. I think this is the most outrageous claim. Um, and I haven't heard anyone else say this exactly, but I think that our beauty standards are actually completely not arbitrary. And they are based on three attributes. The ho or you could call it the holy trinity of beauty. And that is youth, fertility and health. These are three attributes that everyone wants and are recognized as being universally good, like universally beneficial. Um, and you cannot argue that they are not um, they are not beneficial to have. Yes, I know you can argue that like, okay, when you're old, you have wisdom on your side. Absolutely. But when you take humans as a species and as a reproductive organism, those three things, health, fertility, and youth are absolutely essential. And while beauty standards obviously vary from culture to culture, they have these central, you, the vast majority of them, and we can all think of exceptions, but the vast majority of them all have these central tenants um, that they rely on, uh, on health, uh, fertility, and youth. And the third claim that 
I think is really outrageous, but also really, really, really hard for people to even see and to pick apart is that our beauty standards are 100% totally socially constructed. This really annoys me because it's so obvious to me that they are not totally constructed. And in fact, especially if you take those three tenants that I talked about before, they're actually deeply rooted in biology. The reason that we find attractive, what we find attractive, isn't because of socialization, it's because of inbuilt, innate biological preferences. And obviously there is a really, really widespread um, kind of, uh, like, like just a widely head of, held opinion today that just like everything is down to socialization everything is down to everything is a social construct and this is where body positivity kind of fits into this whole like postmodern framework where like there is no objective truth there is only um there are everything about our societies are completely socially constructed and nothing is rooted in biology so again it's just one of those things that's so part of the cultural zeitgeist that when you when you say it when you say no this isn't due just to socialization ju this isn't just the social construct people are like what no it can't like people are so brainwashed into thinking that absolutely everything is a social construct and it's almost a taboo to say that anything is rooted in biology but i think there's pretty much consensus that there's with everything there's a social element and there's also a biological element and yes while some of these norms and standards are perpetuated or highlighted through culture where do you think the culture came from culture wasn't just built arbitrarily arbitrarily out of nothing it was built off the back of a biological framework and yes it varies from culture to culture but um but there are still central tenets that you can you can see and you can still see how it's rooted back in biology but for me here's the real kicker people who you see a lot of sort of posts of say like a really really morbidly obese woman and uh, it's sort of a body positivity like instagram page or whatever and she's not only saying like i love my body i love being this size which is totally fine by the way i ha i'm have no problem with cool it's your body your life is a free country do whatever you want but then they say things like you will find this attractive you must find this attractive if you are a man and you don't want to date me because i'm overweight you're like fattest you are like fat phobic and like that you that they dictate to us that you are required to find this as attractive if if not more attractive than what your kind of natural preferences and natural inclinations are. Otherwise you get canceled and you get called fat phobic and you get, you know, you get completely um, attacked for having a different preference. And I cannot think of anything that is more socially constructed than that. Like if a person has natural preferences, they prefer, you know, a slim woman or man or whatever, um, and then you're telling them, no, you must find um, size, you know, whatever to be more attractive than that. Like, and, and if you don't, you will get shouted down, you will get called out, you'll get cancelled. I can't think of anything more socially constructed than that. Like, and, and that is why that claim that it's socially constructed is so, so, so annoying to me because they are literally trying to invert... Um, the social norms and what people um, just naturally gravitate towards. And then they call those things that people naturally gravitate towards socially constructed. It's absolutely a mind boggling piece of mental gymnastics and massively, massively, massively hypocritical. So a couple more observations I want to make before I move on to part two of this is that often um, people make the claim, well, women make the claim that women are un women's bodies are under far more scrutiny than men and that there is far more pressure on women to look a certain way. And I think that this is completely untrue and that in this way, we, you know, we've become, we've gotten very, we're very much normalized talking about women's problems, but we're completely blind to men's problems. And I used to 
I, I used to believe this too, just because default factory setting, that's, you know, what we're taught and that's what we're told as women. Um, and then 10 years ago, uh, four or five years, I worked in a male dominated gym where like 80, 90% of the members were men. And getting to know them and talking to them, I saw that they had so many insecurities about their bodies. They felt so much pressure to feel, to look a certain way, to be more chiseled, to have more, um, to be bigger and have more muscle, to have less body fat. Um, like the smaller guys felt a lot of insecurity around their bodies and they felt like they were under a lot of scrutiny all the time. And a lot of them really tightly controlled their diet and their training. Um, and it just made me realize that men are also under these social pressures. And women often make the claim that, you know, when you see billboards and um, like models and like say underwear adver advertisements, um, it's always, you know, these absolutely perfect, completely unattainable figures of women that we see. But the same is true of men. Like, when was the last time you saw a fat, hairy, male, uh, ugly male underwear model? You don't. Like, if you see a Calvin Klein billboard, it's always this, like, Greek god-like physique and absolute perfect, you know, facial features, absolutely, you know, perfect man in every way, shape and form. And what we're seeing recently is a, is a really big move towards, you know, showing different bodies and different shape bodies, but only with women. So we're seeing like, if you go onto like ASOS or any clothes or um, whatever website, you, you now see a range of bodies, which I think is a good thing. It's, it's, it's great, but you don't see that with men. You only see it with women. And there's actually some really amusing examples where, you know, you have like um, a plus size mannequin or model right next to one of these Greek God male models. Um, and it's just so many examples of that today that we haven't, we're not showing pictures of like fat, hairy men, like average men with beer bellies. We're, we, we still show those images, those perfect images of men. And, and I think that we are collectively totally, totally blind to that. But also, you know, I have worked for the past 10 years with mums predominantly and on my online program, you know, I work closely with mums. I do work with some men. Um, but something that comes up really, really often um, is that my clients will um, tell me and um, like disclose to me that they have a lot of concern about their husband. He's gained a lot of weight over the past few years. Um, he's carrying too much body fat. He doesn't exercise. His diet is really poor. And I think he has some really bad eating habits. And, you know, I really want him to sort himself out and get rid of a few pounds. And, um, and, 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 and I think it's really, really common for women to express that kind of concern over their husbands. And I think it's healthy, by the way. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But it does occur to me that it is impossible to do the opposite. Like it doesn't go, it's only one way. Men can't express that kind of concern over their wives and say, you know, oh, you know, since we've had kids, she's gained about 10, 20 kilos. And, uh, you know, she's she's carrying a bit too much body fat. And, I, you know, her, her eating habits have gotten really bad and she doesn't exercise. And I really want her to take care of herself more. Like We don't accept that that's considered to be, you know, a really awful thing for a man to say. But it is just so, so, so commonplace and OK for a woman to say that about her husband. And I'm not arguing that women shouldn't say that and have that kind of concern over their husbands because I think it is concerning when someone puts on weight and that we should they should aim to lose some weight to, to become more, to become more healthy as well as improving their diet as well as you know exercising things like that I'm just arguing that I think that it is not socially acceptable for men to say that and it probably should be I'm really just pointing out that there is a double standard there um, that I do think most women are completely blind to and then another observation I want to make and something else that I get, like a, a really common piece of pushback, like an objection that I really, really often get is like, well, what about the fashion industry? You know, women are inundated with images of really, really stick. Like if you take the, just like catwalk modeling, for example, really, really, really skinny, like completely unrealistic um, uh, images for women and young girls to be seeing. And I absolutely agree with that. 
I, I do. I think that that is not something that we should be trying to achieve. And I don't think it's healthy even to be using those sorts of bodies as um, as like the norm for the fashion industry. But like, I think there's a few things that people miss. Um, one, we've been criticizing the fashion industry and the practices and how like the expectations um, for weight and then the ways that women go about um, trying to lose weight in a really, really unhealthy way. We've been talking about that for like two decades at least. Like I remember talking, how, talking about that when I was a teenager. But also the fashion industry is completely dominated by women and gay men. So like, yes, this is a like terrible standard and we should not be aspiring towards it. And I think it should change. But women and gay men are completely in control of this industry. They are the consumers of the industry and they are the ones that that decide on, on, on the creators of the industry. They're the fashion designers. They're the ones who like run the show. So women and, and gay men are completely responsible for creating those images and they're the ones responsible for changing it so again i disagree with the fashion industry and the norms of it i disagree with glossy magazines and all of that kind of stuff um but the people who are at the at, at, at the you know at the wheel here are like are the ones that need to change it and also if you ask most straight men what their preferences are for women, like, you know, they have a range, a pretty big range of what they find attractive from really quite slender to, you know, carrying a little bit of body fat. Like, and they're, they're quite happy with everything. Most men are happy with everything in between that norm and they have a range that they find attractive. But very, very, very few men will say, I like that kind of really stick thin catwalk model, you know, Victoria Beckham look. Like, there, there, are, there are obviously men that like that, but they are few and far between. And finally, there's this kind of um, way that people in the body positivity movement talk about, you know, being lean and being slim and having a low body fat percentage. Um, and, you know, what, ha watching your diet and, um, and, and exercising, um, among other reasons to control body weight. And they talk about it as though, like, this is not a noble pursuit. Like, you know, they say things like, uh, your whole life shouldn't be about being smaller and there are more important things in life than um, than being a certain body weight or a certain body fat percentage. And it's ab that's absolutely true. But they make out as though this is some, like this is not a noble pursuit. This is a waste of time and there are better things you can be doing with your time. But I always think like the flip side of that is like, okay, so just eating whatever you want all the time, never restricting yourself in any way even when it's wasteful, even when you don't need it, even when it's clearly well above your calorie needs, your energy needs, like, how is that a more noble pursuit than aiming to be as, like, healthy as you can be, which includes having a low body weight? Why, even if, even if your goals are just aesthetic, even if you, you're just doing it because you want to look a certain way, why is that a less noble pursuit than just eating whatever you want all the time and never having any limitations on the food that you eat. Like how, that doesn't quite add up for me. Okay, so with that, let's move on to part two. Why body positivity? Like why does body positivity exist? And I, I think that it's a couple of things. I think that first of all, it, um, it, it, it's a backlash to, like I said earlier, that kind of really toxic 1990s, like starvation diet, size zero, all those like fad diets that we all watched our mums go through. Like that was such a toxic environment. I don't know about you, but I grew up in a house where my mum was constantly on a diet. Every woman that I knew in my life, you know, I, I was a teenager through the 1990s and every woman that I knew, every grown woman that was constantly on the na next fad diet and had a huge collection of um, diet books in her house and would tr go, to, go from one diet to the next thinking it's going to be the next, you know, the, the, it's going to be the thing that changes her life and gets her back to her pre-baby body weight. And, and so many of us, and I, I know this because I've seen this with so many of my clients as well, we've grown up with that really, really icky culture at home. And we've watched our mums torture themselves for like decades. And for those of us whose 
parents are still alive because my mother passed away 15 years ago um, when she was 47. Um, for those of them that are still alive, you know, our mums are like in our 60s now and they are still just doing really stupid fucking fad diets crashing and burning and then going back to their old shitty eating habits and never ever ever covering the basis of like eating enough but not too much getting a well-balanced diet 80 20 approach to nutrition um having like controlling portions making sure they're never hungry eating filling foods like all of these like absolute basics they think they just, they just don't even consider. They just think it's the next fad diet, cutting out carbs, going keto, doing whole 30, that, like that's the next. They have to completely overhaul their lifestyle. And none of us want that. None of us want that for ourselves or for our children. And that's completely, completely, um, like it completely makes sense to me. And when, this is the problem that I have with false dichotomies, because when you have, those are the two options, the only two options, like either you're completely obsessed with your health and like it completely dominates your entire life and you know we all know middle-aged women who are really really skinny and health conscious but they eat like birds and they are constantly exercising and they're completely obsessed with their diets and none of us wants to be that but we also know lots of really overweight middle-aged women who are just you know doing fad diet after fad diet and never succeeding and when the only that's the only other option in our kind of in our mind it's either like body positivity has come has come about in the past few years and it kind of just offers an alternative to all of that shit that we obviously don't want and I really can see why if those are the only two options in your mind you're completely drawn towards you know, option number two, a body positivity, because the first one is absolutely unbearable. But this is a big part of why I want to talk about this topic and offer kind of a third way, you know, a middle way where you don't have to be one extreme or the other. So I think that body positivity is a really big backlash to all of that, all of that toxic diet culture, all of that 1990 shit, all of like what we watched our mums go through for, for decades. So there's the backlash element of it. And then to add to that, just today's food environment. If you look back over human history, up to about 70 years ago, food was incredibly scarce. And it always has been, and it's been hard to come by. It's been expensive. It's also been difficult to process. We, we had to, like until like a hundred years ago or whenever, you know, we were making our own cheeses at home and milking our own cows and, 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 and making these products, making these foodstuffs where everything was completely homemade. Everything had to be made by hand. We had little ways of preserving things. You know, food was a really, really, really valuable resource. And in the past sort of, 70 50 years there's been just this explosion of processed foods that are hyper palatable that have a long shelf life that you know just make your all of your dopamine circuitry go off like fireworks um and that are extremely calorie dense um and it's just become so 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 easy to gain weight and actually incredibly difficult to lose weight because of this food environment where you know food is so abundant and it's just so readily available and we don't have to you know make it ourselves we can just buy it ready so it's just kind of created this environment where it's so easy to gain weight and actually so so difficult to get rid of it that the, it kind of make like it makes sense that then people have sort of gone well why don't we just make this fashionable why don't we just make this this like acceptable why don't we just make this the new norm but to add a third element into kind of the 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 today's environment that i think has led to body positivity actually becoming a thing is that we kind of have this like excess of compassion where we sort of tell people what they want to hear um, and, and we see this in so many areas. I mean, especially, I think it's especially true for women. You know, you see it in women's self-help, right? Instead of saying, okay, like, what are the things that are not going well in your life? What are you not doing well? Let's 
work on those and increase your competence in those things and then your confidence will increase as a result like do you need to sort out work do you need to sort out your relationships let's sort of work towards you becoming better and more competent in those areas instead women's self-help is all based around you know affirmations and post-it notes on your mirror and calling each other queens and like goddesses and just boosting up like confidence without actually increasing confidence uh sorry boosting confidence without actually increasing competence and I think that body positivity we also see that in like uh we see it in women's self-help we see it in business you know like um like instead of you know women love to talk about imposter syndrome and instead of talking about okay well why do you have imposter syndrome is it because you know you have tons and tons and tons of experience and you're really good at what you do and you just have really low levels of confidence because in that case yes absolutely you need to increase your confidence but what i see is a lot of women who have no experience and very little training and very little knowledge and very little you know practical ability to be able to actually you know do a job and trying to just increase their confidence saying they have imposter syndrome well maybe if you start from the bottom and work your way up and increase your um experience and increase your training and your knowledge over a number of years you will become more confident and and in what you're doing and obviously this isn't everyone but i think this is something that we see a lot in you know all areas of self-help like business help um relationship help for women is just kind of boosting people up and affirmations and and things like that rather than actually looking at the areas that maybe you're not performing in maybe you are you are you are lacking in and trying to build those up and i think that that men are possibly a little bit better at this than women are they sort of focus on you know what things you need to improve and then in a very very practical sense um and then and and then try to get better at those things whereas again women women tend to a lot of women self-help online tends to just fall into this kind of affirmations like you're a goddess you're a queen kind of category and i think body positivity is part of that wider movement where you know i've I, like i've been criticized a lot um for you know for for saying this kind of message like you know okay well maybe you're not so good at these areas and let's sort of bring you up in these areas and and you get shouted down like oh why women should lift each other up not lock, not lock each other down it's like yeah ab- that's absolutely true but lifting each other up shouldn't just be telling each other that we're perfect in every single way like that shouldn't be the norm we should also we we're all imperfect and we all have things that we need to work on myself included and this is something i try to work really hard on with my clients and i think it's why i get good results is because i am very direct about okay well here are the areas that you're maybe making mistakes or not doing so well at and yes you have to deliver it with kindness you have to deliver it with compassion you know a shit sandwich like say something good something bad something good again like you have to do all of those things you have to be very gentle and you know deliver it in the right way because because it's it, they're hard things to hear and they're hard things to say but i really do believe that this is the way that we should be sort of building each other up rather than just you know telling ourselves empty platitudes that sound nice but don't actually help anyone like you know you're a goddess and you're a queen and body positivity and yeah you know, there's a reason why we have that sentence to be cruel to be kind because sometimes the truth hurts but the truth will also set you free in the truth you can actually improve and become a better human in lots of different areas and i think people are like in particular like i you know have been sort of alluding at i think particularly women are sort of losing that and instead just focusing on positive 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 all the time positive reinforcement all the time and it kind of becomes this toxic positivity and just this bypassing of all the negative you know if something sucks if it looks like shit smells like shit you know don't call it a bunch of flowers and i think there's a really big gap in every area of women's self help where we need to sort of you know we need a little bit of tough love of saying these are maybe these are the areas where you you're not doing so well and you need to build up and body positivity fits into that wider social context of like you know women telling each other these things that are nice to hear and saying what people want to hear but 
not telling the truth. And when we don't tell the truth, we get really, really you know, bad things happen. Like it's just not healthy for us. And I don't think it's healthy for us as humans to just think we're perfect as we are in every way. If instead we should see each other, see each other and ourselves as having strengths and weaknesses, and we should triple down on our strengths, but we probably also need to bring our weaknesses up to a certain level as well. And unless you're, you know, strong enough and courageous enough to be honest with people they can't even see we have this culture of sort of not even being able to see our faults in any way and being hypersensitive to any illusion that we might be imperfect and we might have things that we need to work on so they're kind of the big reasons why i think body positivity exists today's food environment being a backlash to the really toxic diet culture and also just this general culture of telling people what they want to hear and finding it very hard to say the truth when the truth hurts a little bit. But also another reason why I think body positivity has kind of gotten so popular is I think that it's actually, I'm going to probably get in a lot of trouble for saying this, but I, I, I do get the feeling that it's embraced by a lot of people who just don't know how to lose weight. Like, you know, my, I, I work with people on fat loss, right? I have an online program for fat loss and there is, there are certain things that we know about fat loss and how it works. There are certain, it is very individual, but there are certain big rocks that we can address and certain things that we understand. And it's not anything magical and sexy, like cutting out carbs or, you know, anything else, but it's more just like, it's more just like the very unsexy, unglamorous basics. And I think that some people have just, they've been trying to lose weight for such a long time and they just feel so hopeless at it that then this other narrative comes along and says, you know, you don't have to even try anymore. Instead of, instead of saying, okay, like maybe try something different and maybe have you tried these things, saying like, you just don't have to try anymore. You just need to do a completely different project of just trying to love your body exactly as it is. And I think that's really, really tempting. And I can understand, I have a lot of empathy for those people that I understand why, you know, they, they felt stuck for a long time and now they have a different solution. Instead of smashing their head against a brick wall, they have a different way of going about it that, um, like a different option, which I think sounds really, really appealing. But I also think that a lot of people that have jumped on the bandwagon are kind of like skinny people who know how to track calories, who know how to control their weight. And it's just kind of a form of virtue signaling. They just say these, regurgitate these sound bites because they recognize that they are skinny, that they're slim, that they're lean, they are what other people want to be. And, and, and they don't want to come across as being arrogant. And so it's just very easy to just wave the body positivity banner. Um, I mean, there's some, some really obvious, like awful stuff when you have like this really skinny woman that's like, look, I have fat rolls too. And she's literally just got like creases in her skin. Um, that's just so, so, so tone deaf. But there's also other iterations of this. Like there's this one woman that I follow, for example, who spent years being a, um, like a competitor, like a bodybuilding competitor, bikini competitor, and had eating disorders and control and had such a low body fat percentage. Like I'm talking like, you know, 13% body fat, something like that. When, you know, for women at 17% body fat, that's the cut cutoff point for hormonal health, like below 17% body fat, you lose your periods. And she spent years with eating disorders and really restricting her food and being super duper duper lean. And then she's now discovered sort of intuitive eating, which is an entire other <laughs> um, topic to do a podcast on. She's discovered intuitive eating and now her weight has gravitated up to say like, 17, 18% body fat. And she's finally healthy again. And she sees herself as being quite big compared to what she was. But she is so much skinnier than anyone else that like, like the vast majority of people, like she's slimmer than I was or like the, leaner than I, she is leaner than I was at my absolute leanest um, when I worked with a coach and worked really, really hard on it. I mean, but she's kind of gravitated up towards that probably because of some genetic tendencies, but also because of 
habits that she's acquired over years um and through sort of intuitive she, she calls it she says like you know now i eat intuitively and you should too but this is a very different thing when you've come off the back of tracking calories for years and years and years and knowing i i know as a for a fact that she knows exactly how many calories is in every morsel of food to the decimal point um, and once you know this stuff, you can't unknow it. So when she's making decisions about what to eat and how much to eat, it's not based off of pure intuition. It's based off of all of her history of tracking calories and knowing how much is in stuff and making sure that she's getting the right macronutrient ratios. And you know, that stuff stays with you. This is one of the reasons why I recommend to my clients to track calories for a period of time because you learn invaluable information about food that you can't unlearn that always will be with you for the rest of your life and will inform your decisions. And I think that is a good thing in a world where we have so much calorie dense, hyper palatable foods. It's a fantastic thing to have information about those foods and to be able to make more informed decisions and understand what your budget is and be able to, you know, budget accordingly. My point is, is that women like her argue for an intuitive eating approach, but intuition is not informing her decisions. Yes, there's a bit of like, what do I fancy? Which is great for someone like her who needs to loosen up a bit. But the vast majority of people are coming from a point of view where they're actually overweight and they actually need to tighten up a little bit. And intuitive eating isn't the tool that you need to use that. Like there are different tools for different jobs, you know, a hammer is great for hammering in nails, but it's terrible for wiping your bum. Like you need different tools for different jobs and tracking can be an incredibly useful tool for somebody who massively overeats and doesn't know how much they need. Um, but it's probably not a very good tool for somebody who's trying to overcome eating disorders because they're so, so, so controlled over what they eat. Like we, we need different tools for different people here. And I think we tend to sort of paint everything with the same brush. Like, oh, because this intuitive eating tool helped somebody get out of um, like uh, disordered eating, it doesn't mean that it's gonna help somebody to finally get control of their weight and their health and make better decisions about food. So those are the different reasons why I think body positivity is even a thing. And I wanna move on to part three, the impact that I think it has. And um, what I see in my work is that a lot of people have limiting beliefs and ambivalence about the process of fat loss. And there are lots and lots and lots of reasons why people have limiting beliefs and ambivalence um, that then call, that hold them back from being able to do what they need to do to reach their goals. Um, and it's multifactorial, right? But one of the things that comes into it is body positivity. Like they have consumed so many messages over the years of you should never restrict yourself in any way. Tracking calories leads to disordered eating. Um, you should you 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 shouldn't limit yourself with um, with um, uh, any sorts of foods that that being overweight or being a higher body fat percentage is not only healthy, but it's also beautiful. And when they have these kind of messages in their heads that they've kind of internalized, they have this kind of natural feeling that they, that they, they can't help. A lot of people come to me sort of saying, you know, despite being down this rabbit hole for years and years and years, I still have this feeling that I want to lose weight. Um, but often when people get stuck working with me, because a lot of people do they suddenly get stuck they start self-sabotaging like they start to plateau they can't get through this certain point um you have to just to, to talk about their limiting beliefs and um and and any ambivalence that they have around the process and sometimes their limiting beliefs are things like you know i like it's genetic my whole family's overweight i can't lose weight or things like you know 95 percent of diets fail so there's no point in me even trying which is completely false by the way but a lot of it is often due to messages that they've received about body positivity and how it's wrong to want to control your weight in any way. And that makes it very, very hard to commit to the things they want to, the, 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 their long-term goals that they want to achieve, to achieve of losing body fat um, because they still have these beliefs that then pull them away from that. And I think it's really important to have some like clarity and integrate those 
those different like um opposing beliefs because it's fine if you want to be if you have decided to go down the body positivity route and you just want to be there and you think dieting is like the worst thing in the world and there's no healthy way to diet or to lose fat then fine but you want to have total like you know 100% yeah I'm in this camp and no doubts about it because otherwise those doubts hold you back and vice versa and I just see so many people who have a lot of ambivalence because of messages that they've received about body positivity. And I think it can really hold people back from getting healthier and to really feeling good about their bodies. I think there are also, I've met a lot of people who have said, you know, I'm morbidly obese. I want to lose weight but for so many years i didn't because i bought into the body positivity narrative and um i believed that i was i could still be healthy at this size and it just reinforced it just told me what i wanted to hear and it just reinforced you know what i the fact that i wanted to overeat all the time and it was only when i had a health scare and that i really realized that my weight was affecting my quality of life and it was affecting my health and that it could have a severe impact on my health and quality of life in the future that i kind of took the red pill and realized that i'd just been lied to um by well-intentioned people but at the end of the day we're not doing people any favors. We're telling them that it's okay to be extremely overweight when it really is a massive risk factor for a lot of health conditions. So let's move on to part four, a kind of conclusion, because I think I've said this from the beginning, but I wanna make really, really, really clear that I do think, while I do think that there is like this body positivity culture, and I consider it to be a very, ex like a, a one extreme end of the spectrum. What I am not advocating for is the other extreme, right? That kind of toxic diet culture that we all know exists. What I'm arguing is that not all attempts to lose body fat are an example of toxic diet culture, that there is actually like a healthy middle ground where you can both, uh, you can both sort of love your body and work towards accepting yourself, but also work towards long-term goals. That if you do want to change your body for any reason and in any way, that doesn't necessarily mean it has to come from a, a place of self-hate. And actually, one of the things that I say a lot with my clients is that you just can't actually do the things you need to do and get to where you want to go and change your body if it's coming from a place of hate. It actually has to come from a place of love for yourself and wanting what's best for yourself. Um, and, 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 and these two things don't have to um like they, they don't they, they they two different things can be true at the same time you can value yourself as a person and love who you are and realize that you're a great you know mother that you are really successful in your career you're a great partner you're a really great person but this one area of your life you want to change you want to lose 10 kilos 20 kilos whatever and you want to get you want to be uh you want to feel a certain way you want to be healthy and you want to look a certain way i think that is okay as well that that can come from um that can come from a good place and it doesn't necessarily fall into the other extreme of toxic diet culture i also think that even if your goals are mostly aesthetic right so for me you know my most recent fat loss journey was after my second son was born and I was about 10 kilos over where I felt my best. And the first five kilos was probably more of a health thing. Like I felt very big and, and heavy and um, it, like I was carrying a bit too much body fat. But the second five kilos were more aesthetic. Like I just wanted to look and feel a certain way. And I had to restrict my calories. I had to restrict my food intake in order to do that. And there's a, there's a healthy way of doing that where you're not hungry. You ha still have to give up. You, know, you still have to sacrifice certain things, but you can do it in a way that's sensible, that you're not hungry, that you don't go batshit crazy, that you have wiggle room for events and for fun foods. Um, but even when the goal is purely aesthetic, I think that that is okay. It's okay to have that sort of goal. And just as like, you know, 
um, people in the body positivity camp will say, you know, that you shouldn't shame people for looking a certain way or for wanting to look a certain way, which I, I think is absolutely true. The uh, the opposite is true as well, that if you just want to, to look a certain way, if you just want to get slimmer, that we shouldn't shame people, like fit shame people for that either. And while I agree that it is not the most important thing in the world, it is not, it shouldn't be the most important thing about you. And, um, and in many ways, it's kind of a bit, you could argue that it's a bit of an arbitrary pursuit, but you know what? I have a friend who's really big time into pottery and she's really good at making stuff out of clay. And she goes to all these workshops. She's been doing it for like years and she goes to all these workshops and she learns how to do it better and learns all these different techniques. And, you know, she's completely like fine at put, like, I mean, she's really, really good at making pottery. She has no need. You know, she could just buy this stuff from the, from the shops. Like she has no need to make pottery. She certainly has no need to get better at pottery, but she still does it because it's a fun pursuit for her. It's something that she enjoys doing and being the pursuit of being fit and being really lean, um, like, you know, I'm talking about getting like sub 20% body fat for women or 10% for men. Like, this can be a fun, empowering pursuit and it can be a bit of a hobby. I would also argue that, you know, the closer you get down towards about 20% body fat as a woman, the healthier you get, like the health, actually, your health actually increases. Um, I think a lot of people would dispute that and argue more that there's a range, but I think um, there's some evidence to say that you would actually get healthier. But even if it's fully uh, aesthetic, it's still a valid pursuit and it's still something that is worth spending time on if you enjoy it and if it's something that you want for yourself and hopefully by now it should be obvious that it doesn't mean that we have to fat shame right i would never shame somebody for being overweight i wouldn't even bring it up as a topic like just like i have a friend who smokes and i don't question her about smoking right it's like she knows it's not healthy she doesn't need me like giving her shit about it I wouldn't challenge anyone who's overweight either. And I think we, we have a lot of um, people saying, you know, it's okay to like question people about their weight. No, it's not. Nobody ever says that's okay. And if anyone ever does it, we recognize that that's a not okay thing to do. Um, I'm not arguing. It should hopefully be, be painfully obvious by now that I'm not arguing that we should shame people or, you know, and, and, and I fully appreciate if you want to go down the body positive route, if somebody wants to be, um, body positive, then fine. I don't have a problem with it. It's your your body, and I'm not here to convince you otherwise. I'm more here to talk to people who want to hear a kind of middle ground of it and who need help sort of validating how they feel around the topic. Um, but I do think the opposite should be true, that you should be able to get leaner if that's what you want to do. And one final thing, I think that um, it should not be okay what shouldn't be happening in body positivity circles is that they shouldn't be dictating to other people what they find attractive and what they think looks good. You can do whatever you want with your body, but nobody else is required to agree with you. Nobody else is required to say that they think you look good. Nobody else is required to, you know, want to date somebody that size. Um, we are allowed to have our own preferences. And that goes for people who are body positive and people who are not. I always think it's interesting how much they say, you know, my body, my choice, until it comes to somebody who has a different point of view to them. And I wanna finish off by just touching on, like, why is being lean so, why does it have the status that it has? Like, why do so many of us want to be lean? And, because I think this is important because a lot of people, again, sort of, the only thing we hear about it is that it's completely arbitrary and it's totally socially constructed. And I don't think that's true. I think a couple of things. I think that first of all, it goes back to what I said about our beauty standards not being arbitrary and actually based in biology and based in youth, health and fertility. Um, but also because I think that it's hard, right? Being lean, being a lower body fat percentage is harder than being a higher body fat percentage. Being 20% body fat is harder than being 30% body fat. Like having some control over what you eat is, is, is difficult for many reasons. And 
things that are harder have more status, whether you like it or not. Like being a doctor has more status than being a nurse. And you might think that that's wrong, but it, it's harder to study to be a doctor. It's harder to become a doctor than it is to become a nurse. Or like, being a doctor has more status than my job as kind of like a fat loss coach. Um, and, 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 and there's a reason for that. It's harder to, to do that. Like not everyone can do it. Um, and this is true of everything that gives us status. So being lean is kind of a social flex. Like it's kind of the ultimate so, so, social flex because not everyone can do it. And because it shows that you have put some hard work in. Yes, some people benefit from genetics 100%. Um, but again, like when they benefit from genetics, these are, you know, um, universally, uh, they, they, they're acquiring universally um, beneficial and good traits. So, it, you know, it still makes sense that it would um, have some social status. And also, it does take a certain amount of resources to be able to control your weight. In today's food environment, if you just don't pay attention and just eat mindlessly, you know, you, you, you're gonna put on weight, right? If you just eat whatever's available and becoming lean does involve having some knowledge about what to eat and how much, um, and not everyone has access to that information, it has, it requires knowledge on food preparation and, um, and, 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 you know, just how to like what things to acquire in the first place. It requires some time, you know, to pr prep things from scratch. Although, you know, I often argue that there's lots and lots of, you know, really easy, cheap, um, things that you can use to make uh, like convenience foods that you can use to make your life so much easier. And it does require some time, but it also requires um, certain emotional skills. So understanding certain things about yourself, um, having a certain amount of um, awareness, like self-awareness. I work a lot with my clients on much bigger, wider, um, you know, psychological factors, like understanding, like managing your emotions, managing stress so that you don't fall into self-medicating with food, understanding why you feel a certain way and why you eat a certain way, uh, why certain experiences or certain feelings lead you to eat, eat a certain way. It requires a certain degree of mindfulness and awareness of what you're doing. And we need time and energy and bandwidth to do all of those things. And so not everyone has those resources. Um, so it makes sense that that, that being able to be lean and be healthy and be fit, you know, that the, the, it has a certain social status, mainly because it's hard and it, like easy things don't, people don't want to have easy things because they're easy to come by. Like we want to have things that are harder to have by definition because not everyone can acquire them. Okay, so I think I've gotten to the end of my long list of things that I wanted to discuss. Um, that was a long one. Not all of my podcasts are going to be an hour long. They're going to be more like 20 minutes um, discussing kind of less complicated topics. But I hope you found this discussion helpful. And I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear what you think, whether you agree with me or think I'm completely full of shit. Um, you know, let me know if you disagree what, with, what I'm, or with what I'm saying here. Um, I might make a second podcast on this topic where I go through some of the objections if I get, uh, if I get any. Thanks for tuning in and thanks for listening to this podcast on body positivity.